So Jennifer just asked on our friend day if we could have a baby dedication day as well. So we're going to have a baby dedication day on that day as well. All right, let's take our Bibles this morning, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7. In our devotions for the last two weeks, we've been looking at the uh, Sermon on the Mount, talking about a blessed life. We didn't look at everything, um, but the scripture that I want to read you is probably three of the most disconcerting, dangerous verses that you could ever read. Jesus is saying this, all right, Jesus is saying this. He said this in verse number 21, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Wow. I never knew you. Lord, we've done all these great things. I never knew you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us this morning. And Lord, we pray as we look at this subject, God, I pray that you'll just give us clarity. Lord, I do pray for anyone that's here today or even anyone that's watching through Facebook Live and who are not sure of their standing with you in regards to salvation. I do pray that, Holy Spirit, that we sung about the comforter and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would speak to every heart and have your will and way in the service today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the 11th and 12th century B.C., there were some wars that were going on, and many of us have heard about these, called the Trojan Wars. The Trojans were those from a city called Troy, and they had great fights between different countries, and Greece being one of them. Their walls were impenetrable, and the Greeks found that out. They couldn't get through the walls of Troy, so they devised a plan, which is a very well-known plan, where they made a, what we call a Trojan horse, all made of wood, and they put a few of their soldiers up in that Trojan horse. And what they did was, is they feigned defeat, and they presented this Trojan horse to the people of Troy, the Trojans, as a sign of respect and uh, admiration for the god of war. And they left it out the front. The Greeks all supposedly went off, and the Trojans came out and dragged that horse into their city, locked, locked the gate, went to bed, so on. And under the cover of darkness... The soldiers that were in that horse, in that Trojan horse, came out, opened the gates, the Greeks came in and, of course, destroyed Troy, the Trojan horse. Very well known. Nowadays, when you talk about a Trojan horse, it's metaphorically speaking, when something is done out of deceit or craftiness or unbeknownst to someone else, it's known as a Trojan horse. And uh, what we want to talk about today is, is, a, is a Trojan horse that I feel for a long time now has uh, been creeping into a lot of churches and I would say in particular over the last few years independent fundamental Baptist churches. It's very pronounced in the Southern Baptist Convention over in America and, and so on and we all know that what happens in America down the track we, we cop it here. Uh, and I want to talk to you this morning on the, on the, on the doctrine of uh, the Trojan horse of Lordship Salvation. And Lordship Salvation is one of those Trojan horses because Lordship Salvation is a very crafty, well-formulated doctrine that really is a backdoor to works-based salvation. I'm going to share some names in a moment and not because I have anything against these well-known preachers and writers, but their messages and others of that persuasion are having great impact in church life. Today, the Trojan horse of Lordship Salvation is found firmly in Calvinism. Uh, reformed theology, 
the Puritans, the Puritans, the Brethren movement. Ever heard? The Brethren movement were such a powerhouse. I went to a Brethren Christian school back in the day and uh, doing some research on, on the message found out that the Brethren movement, who also come from and the like of the Puritans and so on and so forth and John Darby and, and all of that, all held to this thought of lordship salvation. Uh, we've all heard of the, the term tulip in, in Calvinism. T stands for total depravity. U stands for unconditional election. L stands for limited atonement. I is irresistible grace. And P is for the perseverance of the saints. And the whole thing about the perseverance of the saints, the term perseverance of the saints is the foundation for work salvation because you actually have to do something to make it. And if you don't persevere, well, you're in trouble. The Bible talks about preservation of the saints. I think it's Jude that writes to those who are preserved in Christ. So when you got saved, you were preserved Right, you were preserved. You, you don't. You didn't have to do anything to get saved. You don't do anything to keep being saved. You, when you, when you trusted Christ as your saviour, you were preserved in Christ. There's a massive difference between preserved in Christ and perseverance of the saints. All right. The saying for lordship salvation is this: If he's not lord of all, he's not lord at all. And I've heard that in our circles. And more so from the, the Bible Belt, you know, uh, through the southern states of America, what we call the Bible Belt of America. And a lot of those guys come out and, and they, don't, they don't say it right off the bat and say, well, we preach lordship salvation. They say things, phrases that point to that. If he's not lord of all, he's not lord at all. Let me tell you something right now. Regardless of whether you make him lord of all, he is still lord of all. It doesn't matter what you, what you say, what you... But Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what he is. That's who he is. He is Lord. Now, again, I'm just going to share a couple of names. And, and, I, and I tell you, here's, here's the Trojan aspect of it. There are some great Bible preachers and teachers out there. And these, these two in particular are very well known and they preach some really good stuff. I've heard, I listen to their preaching, I don't I want to be in balance. I hear stuff, so okay, I'll go and listen to what they've got to say. I've got a friend of mine who, who uh, he, 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 he loves John MacArthur, he doesn't believe with everything about John MacArthur, who's one of the guys that I want to talk about. And he would say, listen to this and listen to that. And on my walks, I'd listen to, to what he's got. And, he, and, and he's got some really good stuff to preach. But that's the Trojan of this whole thing. They preach a lot of good stuff over here that gets you in. And when they bring out their position on salvation, what happens is, is we make allowances. Well, he didn't really say that. He doesn't really mean that. This is, and, and so therefore, because we don't want to think that we've been sold a Trojan horse, we don't think that this... Great guy who's written many books and preached and, and, and listen, listen, what I respect greatly about John MacArthur is how he stood up to the Californian government during the pandemic. We're still going to worship and they find him and everything got overturned. And I think kudos to you. I mean, I didn't see too many independent Baptist guys doing that. And it really sort of like bugged me because I knew he's Calvinist anyway, but this whole Lordship salvation has crept in and is still creeping in to a lot of independent fundamental Baptist or Bible preaching churches. But the first person I want to talk about is a guy by the name of John Piper. Now, John Piper, John MacArthur, Steve Lawson, Paul Washer, um, uh, the wretched radio guy, all these people that gravitate to the Shepherd's Summit and, and, and the whole thing about John McCarthy, all those guys hold to this Lordship salvation. Paul Washer, who preaches some really, really, really good messages, if you listen to his preaching on salvation, you've got to be so careful because they bring in this, if you don't make Jesus Lord, you can't be saved. And if you are saved, then you will live holy, you will be righteous, you will be this, you will be that. There's no, 
there's no, uh, there's no movement, there's no ground for backsliding. Has anyone here backslidden in their Christian life before? Let's have a show of hands. Let's just, has anyone backslidden? I've backslidden in my life. That means according to that crowd, I was never saved. I was never saved because they teach and preach that you won't. As a matter of fact, let me get a bit ahead of myself. John MacArthur does not believe in two natures. You know how we say we've got the sin nature, the carnal nature, and we've got the uh, God's nature. He doesn't believe in that. So he doesn't agree with what Paul said in Romans chapter 7, that great struggle that he had about the flesh. I know that in me, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. John MacArthur doesn't believe in a carnal Christian. So he doesn't believe that a Christian can be carnal. Well, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and rebuked them for their carnality. So you've got to be so very careful because what happens is, is you gravitate to these guys and more on some of the other stuff that they preach, which is really good, but then they bring in this lordship salvation, which John MacArthur also says it's called discipleship salvation, and we'll get to that in a minute. But John Piper, in, uh, in, in his article on what we believe about Calvinism, I want you to hear very carefully because what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to see what the Bible says about salvation. All right? We're going to see what this says. And if you haven't done what this says, then you need to submit to the Word of God and do what Jesus Christ says to be born again. Am I right? Yeah. All right. So... John Piper says this in his article, What We Believe About Calvinism. Listen carefully. We believe the saints will and must, and I'm going to come to that in a verse a little bit later on, will and must persevere in the obedience which comes from faith. So he's sort of mixing some things here. Election is unconditional, right, because he's a Calvinist. Election is unconditional, but glorification is not you know what he means by glorification? You getting to heaven when you receive your glorified body. Glorification is not... There are many warnings in Scripture that those who do not hold fast to Christ can be lost in the end. So not, as, not only is he endorsing works, he's endorsing you get to lose what you thought you had. You lose your salvation. Let me tell you something right off the bat. We believe in the eternal security of the believer, which means this. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of, of promise until the day of redemption, which is Christ's return. You, you don't lose it, right? And you don't work for it. Otherwise, if you work for your salvation, number one, who sets the platform? Who sets the guidelines? Who tells you what to do? Um, uh, and then when you get to heaven, who, who's, who's done the most works? What did you do to get to heaven? Well, I just trusted Jesus Christ because of his work. Well, let me tell you what I did. No, there's not going to be anyone up there. And there are people in this world, probably watching here, and maybe even here this morning in this small group, that are doing things and thinking that they're saved. They're going to stand before Jesus, and Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. But Lord, I did this and I did that and, and I prophesied and I cast out demons and I healed the sick and I did all these works for you. I didn't know who you were. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's powerful words from Jesus. So Piper is saying that you will, if you're saved, you will and must persevere. You've got to hold fast to Jesus Christ. Don't let him go, otherwise you've lost it. You've lost it. No, listen to this. No, John Piper, no Christian can be sure he is a true believer. Hence, there is an ongoing need to be dedicated to the Lord and deny ourselves so that we might make it. And this is a guy that is embraced greatly, not only in evangelical circles, but in Baptist circles. Now, let me tell you something right here. You can have a difference when it comes to spiritual gifts and not be a heretic. You can have a difference of the timing of the Lord's return and not be a heretic. You can have a difference in how many times you should have the Lord's Supper, once a, month, once a week, once a month, once a year. You can have a difference in that and not be a heretic. But you mess with salvation and you're a heretic. And there are too many Christians who are listening to heretics today and are getting sucked in. There's a Trojan horse out there today. And then you know what happens? 
Because they hear this kind of, well, you've got to hang on and you've got to persevere because if you don't, and there are so many people out there, so many believers out there who are living fearful because it's like, what if I don't do this? Or, oh, what if I do this? And, oh, my goodness, what if I don't read my 10 chapters a day? Or what if, if I don't pray? What if, if I don't go to church? And whatever? Oh, no. You know what I mean? There's just confusion. There's sadness everywhere because they think they're going to die and go to hell. And this is what these guys are preaching and teaching. John MacArthur says this, any doctrine of eternal security. Now, in his message, The Perseverance of the Saints, in a book that he wrote called Hard to Believe. Hard to Believe, because he's against what he calls easy believism. Now, let me tell you something. It's not hard to be born again. These guys are making it hard. They're making it hard. John MacArthur says this, any doctrine of eternal security that leaves out perseverance distorts the doctrine of salvation itself. So they're preaching away and they talk about salvation and they said, oh, by the way, uh, if you want to believe in eternal security, you only have eternal life if you persevere. So here is the thing. That means many of us would have to get saved and re-saved and re-saved and re-saved and re-saved because it's like, well, I dropped the ball a while back. I dropped the ball back here. And man, my teenage years, I tell you right now, for me, my teenage years as a, as a Christian was like, my goodness, I probably wasn't even saved. But I knew when I got saved and that brings in confusion. So Piper says, you don't know. But the Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, have a look at this. Hold, hold your place here in Matthew. Go to 1 John chapter 5 for a moment. For a moment, First John chapter five. Let's have a look at what the Bible says. I think it's more important that we find that out. Amen. First John chapter five. You know, you can know for sure, a hundred percent for sure, that you're saved. And if you this morning, let me tell you right now. Hear me carefully. If you are not one hundred percent sure that you're going to heaven when you die, don't leave here without getting your assurance. Don't leave here without getting you assured. If you're basing your salvation on any other thing, the sacraments, being good, being in church, all those sorts of things, you will die and go straight to hell because you're relying on anything else but Jesus Christ's work on the cross. 1 John 5, look at verse number 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may know that you have eternal life and believe on the name of the Son of God. So here is the thing. John is saying that his little epistle of 1 John wholeheartedly is saying, you just need to read that and you will know if you've got eternal life. But let's take the Bible in its entirety because this book teaches that you can know 100% sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. Or when Jesus comes back in the clouds, you're going to get raptured up to be with him. So the Bible tells you that you can know for sure. And yet there's so many Christians today that think, oh, well, I I think, listen, Jennifer will never forget the day that that baby was born. None of you ladies will forget the day that you gave birth to children. It's embedded in your, in your memory, in your heart. You remember without a shadow. And, and you may not remember as a person the day that you were born, right? But you were born, right? You, you, you were born physically. I have a hard time, really, when people come to me and say, I, I, I think, I, I, I'm sure I got saved. I just can't remember. I just can't remember. That's dangerous grounds to be on because the Bible says that you can know for sure, Right? So John MacArthur says any doctrine of eternal security that leaves out perseverance distorts. John MacArthur calls lordship salvation, working faith salvation, working faith. So in other words, it's faith plus works. And they take James chapter 2 where it talks about the works. Let me tell you where works comes in because we do believe in works. Works comes in after because your works glorify the father who saved you. But John MacArthur and all of those guys that I mentioned before, John Piper and Paul Washer and all those Reformed theologists and Calvinists and Puritans and the Brethren movement all say in Lordship Salvation, it's a working faith. Faith plus works. John MacArthur says this, Lordship Salvation is nothing more than perseverance of the saints. And John MacArthur calls salvation discipleship salvation. 
And the reason for that, I want you to go to Luke 14, Luke chapter 14. And this is where he calls it discipleship salvation. In other words, if you're not a disciple, you're not born again. That means I know a lot of people who are not born again. Because let me tell you what happens. When you get saved, you become a Christian. The next step should be, and I'm going to use that word a little bit later on in the verse, the next step should be discipleship. Should Christians be a disciple? Sure. Does God force it? Or if you're not a disciple, does that mean you're not saved? No, you got saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That was his work. He saved you. And then the normal, product, the, the normal process would be, I want to be a disciple. But it doesn't mean you're a disciple straight away. So you're saved, you become a Christian, and then, then the Spirit of God works on you, and, and you want to become a disciple, and from the pool of discipleship, God draws his leaders from. Because that's exactly the same process for the, for the disciples. He called them and said, follow me. They believed that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. They, they followed him. He then called them disciples, and then later on, what did he call the 12 disciples? He called them apostles. So if anyone, if anyone wants to have a leadership role for the Lord Jesus Christ, then yes, you've got to become born again. You go into the area of discipleship. But discipleship is not salvation. Discipleship is a growth method. And then you go into leadership. Okay. So John MacArthur, because of Luke, Luke 14, have a look at it here, Luke 14. It says, And there were great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own, uh, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, you cannot be born again. Luke 14, 25, 26. So because John MacArthur says discipleship is salvation, he says if you don't do this, then you cannot be saved. So you, you have to, when it ter- says the term hate there, it's a pretty strong word. I mean, I don't, I, my mum's with the Lord. I don't, I never, I, I don't hate my mum. But what he's talking here is that you've got to love him more than anything else. Right? You've got to love him more. So, but John MacArthur's saying that if you don't love Jesus more, or if you don't follow Jesus, if you don't, if you don't do these things, then you cannot be a disciple, which means you cannot be saved. Now, discipleship is a sacrifice. You get born again, you trust Jesus' sacrifice, right, for salvation. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he's buried. That's why he rose again. You trust his sacrifice for salvation. But when he calls you into discipleship, it's a sacrifice on your behalf. It does cost to be a disciple. It does cost. But the cost is not you paying the price to be born again. The cost is not you paying the price to be a disciple. Jesus paid the price for your salvation. No one else pay. You can't pay. You don't you and I don't have the money enough. You don't you and I don't have the works enough to be born again. I've said this before, the Roman Catholic system is sending millions of people to hell because it's all works based. And they believe that they're born again because they take the sacraments. Transubstantiation. You know what trans... Anyone heard of transubstantiation? You know what transubstantiation is? You know when you go to a Catholic church, they've got a little box up in the back here. And what the priest does is he takes the grape juice and the wafer and he goes back here and he puts it into this box and Kalamazoo, Kalamazam, blah, 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 pulls it out and it becomes the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. And everybody comes down and they take the wafer and they take the blood and they believe that they are receiving Jesus Christ as their saviour. They are going to hell. They are going to hell because they believe they've received Christ. There's nothing mystical about the, the, uh, the Lord's Supper. There's nothing mystical about the grape juice and the, and, and the unleavened bread. It's symbolic. It's symbolic. So because of all these works, whether it's Roman Catholicism or whether it's in, uh, in Calvinism or whatever it is, you trusting on your works and you paying the price. Bre- hey, brother, sister, you can pay the price. But the wages, the payment for sin is death. If you want to pay the price for your own sin, pay it. Pay it. But when you die, you're not going to heaven to be with Jesus. You're going straight to hell where Jesus doesn't want you to go. That's why he died on the cross. You've got to put your faith and trust in him, not in what you do. 
So John MacArthur says that, Paul Washer says that, John Piper says all of that. And I spoke during the week about corrupt trees. What kind of fruit tree are you sitting under? Because Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. These are corrupt trees. Corrupt. They have corrupted salvation. They're, they're heretics. I, I personally, you know, when you think about that, I, you, who here wants to, to listen to heretics when it comes to salvation? But they've got some great stuff. That's how the devil works. That's how the devil works. So we've got all this, uh, all this stuff now that these lordship salvationist people teach. And with lordship salvation comes the term, you must repent of your sins. Who's heard that? You must repent of your sins. <clears throat> Let me tell you where I believe repentance comes in because repentance is necessary. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 3, you'll see the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And part of that is repentance from dead works and faith towards God. So your works as an unbeliever or even as a Christian, if you're trying to work to keep being saved or you want to be saved, Jesus says that's dead works. That's not going to get you anywhere. You've got to turn from your dead works, what you're doing, and trust the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, right? So repentance is never. But when they come out and say, you must repent of your sins, when they say that, they're actually saying that you, you've, got to, uh, uh, you've, you've got to yield to Jesus, you've got to, you've got to cease or be willing to cease from sinning in order to be saved. Now, don't put your hands up. Who here has sinned in the last week? Well, I'm sorry, if that's the case, then you're not saved. Because apparently, you were not willing to stop from sinning. You can't Listen, how foolish is it to tell someone, you've, you've got to stop from sinning, you've got to repent of that sin, stop that, or be willing to stop that in order to be saved, and make Jesus Lord, Lord and Saviour of your life? You, I've made him Saviour. No, is he Lord of your life? Have you yielded to his Lordship? This is what they say. Nobody can stop sinning without the help of the comforter that we sang about this morning. And you don't get the comforter until you receive Jesus Christ as your saviour, then you're indwelt with the Spirit of God. And it's the Spirit of God that helps you in your life to overcome the flesh, to, to, to crucify the flesh, to deal with the sin. You can't do it in and of yourself. Have you tried? <laughs> Sure, we've all tried doing it in the flesh. Paul said, there's no good thing that dwells in my flesh. You know, the thing about this group, the Lord's Salvationist group and the Reformed Theology group and, and all of that, they, they say this, their, their mantra is sola scriptura. Have you heard of that? Sola scriptura, sola gratia, and so, uh, sola fidelis, which means this, sola scriptura is scripture alone. Sola gratia is grace alone. And sola fidelis is faith alone. That's what they say. And I, and I agree with that. It's the Bible alone. The Bible is our final throw. Do you know why one of the reasons why I like the term open door Bible church? Because the Bible is our final authority. Not Baptist tradition. We're Baptist in doctrine, but the tradition of Baptist, some of it is just, no, you can have it. I don't want it. The Bible is our final authority. We believe what... You don't take my word at it. That's, that's Roman Catholicism where you just believe the priest. You, don't, you search the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. Am I right? Search the scriptures and see if it's right. So sola scriptura, yeah. Grace alone? Absolutely. Faith alone? Absolutely. But you know what they say? Well, you know, uh, faith is never alone. Faith is never alone. What are they saying? It's a working faith. You've got to keep doing. You've got to work. You've got to persevere. You've got to do all these sorts of things. So let's have a look at some things. I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 7. Everybody all right? Matthew chapter 7. If you're not, I'm sorry about that. Not much I can do about it. Now look at some of the things here that these people that came before Jesus. Lord, Lord. That's where you get, oh, Lord, Lord. Hey, they made him Lord. They were calling Lord, Lord, Lordship. All right? Salvation is not a performance-based criteria. Okay, look at verse number 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Works. 
and in thy name have cast out devils, works, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Have not we, we, we done all these things? Nothing about what Jesus did. It's all what they did. And so their salvation was performance-based. Could you imagine, could you imagine if your performance was based on your salvation? Just think for a minute. Who, number one, as I said before, who set the standard? Uh, the pastor got up and said, I've got to read at least five chapters a day and, and, and pray 15 minutes and witness to two people a day and all this sort of stuff. I mean, who sets the groundworks here? Well, we've got to be like Christ and be like Christ and do the works of Christ. Are you? Am I? So if you're, if you're basing your Christianity on your performance, that's sadly lacking and, and the worst case scenario is that one day you're going to stand before Jesus. He's going to look at you with those piercing eyes and say, I never knew you. Who are you? But Lord, I, Lord, I, I, I started a couple of churches. I started Bethesda Baptist Church and I started Open Door Bible Church and we started uh, Heritage and, and I passed it here and I passed it there. Lord, Lord, look at what I did. I didn't know who you are. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Wow. Secondly, they were basing their assurance on works. They were basing their assurance on their works. And thirdly, they were basing their acceptance of Jesus based on what they were doing. Let me tell you something right now. Let's just, let, okay, let, the assurance is this. You believe what the Bible says about salvation. If you did what the Bible says and you believe that you were a sinner... Because you broke God's law and, and sin is breaking God's law. Who, how many of you know about the Ten Commandments? Know about the Ten Commandments? That's God's law in a nutshell, right? You break one of those, you're a sinner. Guess what? We've all broken them. You've all broken them. I've broken them. So you've got to understand that you're a sinner because the Bible says, Jesus says, God says that you're a sinner and then you've got, to, you've got to acknowledge that, but then you've got to acknowledge what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And one of my pet peeves about Roman Catholicism is Jesus is still there. And that's exactly where the devil wants him. Wants him on the cross and he's all emaciated up there and all that. And I love witnessing to Roman Catholics because I say, I always point them to their I said, why did Jesus die on the cross that you have him up on there still? You know, most Catholics don't even know Got no idea about Bible and stuff and Christianity and what salvation is all. As a matter of fact, if you ask a Roman Catholic, are you a Christian? They say, no, I'm a Roman Catholic. They don't even acknowledge. So, and that's easy to discern. It's like, well, that, hang on. But it's these other guys that come in with the lordship stuff. It's these other guys that come in with the repentance of your sin and all this. Stuff. It's those guys that we've got to be so careful of because it's a works-based salvation there is a weakness of the flesh that versus the willingness of the spirit go with me to matthew 26 matthew 26 if you would matthew 26 there is a weakness of the f and jesus knew this jesus knew about the weakness of the flesh look at matthew 26 verse 40 and he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto peter what could you not watch with me one hour Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus recognized the struggle between your flesh and the spirit. How many of us had a, have had a willing spirit to get up early in the morning and have, and have devotions? But the flesh comes in. Oh man, that bed is so comfortable. Just, just a few more, just a few more minutes, 50 minutes. Put the snooze, snooze. There's another 20 minutes. Snooze. Oh, just one more. Snooze. You know, hey, the spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Jesus knew about our flesh. And he knew the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And he talks about that in Galatians. As a matter of fact, if you want to study a book in the Bible that deals with works and salvation, study Galatians. He knew about the struggle of the flesh. He said that in Galatians 5. That the flesh and the spirit, they're at enmity, one with another, and, and all this sort of stuff. He knew about that. So there is this willingness of the spirit, but the weakness of the flesh. And as I said before, MacArthur doesn't believe in the two natures. 
In other words, if you were to think about it, they actually would believe, to me, they would believe in sinless perfection. Because you, you will and you must. All right? Let's have a look at biblical salvation. What is the criteria for salvation? All right, let's have a look at what the Bible says. And let's start in the Gospel of John. And we're just going to cruise along here. All right, I want you to look at it in your Bible. See what the Bible says. I'm not going to expound on, on all of them, maybe just on a few. All right, first one, John chapter 3. Let's have a look at John chapter 3. Let's see what Jesus had to say. Seeing he's the one who purchased salvation, right? Look at John chapter 3, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, talking about going to the cross, that whosoever what? Sorry, talk to me. Believeth. 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 In him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world and gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He, it doesn't say he that believes and does. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Hey, I, you, you, you might say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I've got to do this. You're condemned. Because you're relying on something else apart from what Jesus Christ did for you. Right? Let's go to, uh, let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 7 about doing the will of the Father? Remember that? Jesus said, Whosoever doeth the will of my Father. The will of the Father was this. Hear ye him. This is my beloved Son. I want you to listen to him. And what's the work? What's the work that we've got to do? What's the will of God? I want you to look at John chapter 6. Look at verse number 29. Jesus answering and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. See that? What's the work? Believing. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Not he that, he that believeth and maketh him Lord, or he that believeth and persevereth. Not he that believeth and does all these other things. It's simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe on him. Believe what? Believe that he died on the cross. The reason why he died on the cross is because you're a sinner. You need saving and only Jesus Christ can save you and nothing else. That's simple. To me, that's easy, right? But that for some reason, there is in mankind this innate ability. I, I want to. I, I've just got to do something for my salvation. It just makes me feel better if I'm doing something. Well, then you're sadly mistaken. Sadly mistaken. Let's go to Acts for a minute. Let's go to Acts chapter eight. Can we go to Acts chapter eight? I'm going to read a verse that, if you have a modern translation, is not there. And if this verse is not there, it's actually corrupted salvation. Right? It's actually corrupted salvation. We're dealing with, uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch. Right? Look at verse number 36. Philip and the eunuch, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptised? Now, I'm not going to read the next verse because I'm going to read what the other modern translations do. They go straight to verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and baptised him. So Philip, uh, the, the Ethiopian eunuch, asked the question, what does hinder me to be baptised? And every modern translation of the Bible skips straight to verse number 38 and they simply go down into the door. Why is that? Because your reason for baptism can be whatever. Whatever you, whatever you want. Well, you know, I, I just simply think this, I simply think that. Look at verse number 37, or listen to verse number 37. And Philip said, Here's, here is the reason why you can get baptised, all right? And here is the hindrance why you can't get baptised. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right there is the confession. Right there is the reason for Baptism, not infant baptism. Infant baptisms of the devil. Infant baptism is not scriptural. Why? Because the baby doesn't believe. 
Roman Catholicism brought that in years ago in AD 300, 312 because Constantine was worried that when children die, they would go to hell. But the Bible is clear that if you die uh, before you understand about sin and that, then you, you go to heaven. That's what David said. I can't go to the child. Uh, sorry, the child can't come to me. I can go to be with the child. So Constantine, Constantine, however you want to pronounce it, said, you know what? We need to baptize babies. That's unscriptural. The reason for, per, for a person getting baptised in water is that they must believe in Jesus Christ with all their heart and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why do every modern translation leave out verse number 37? i tell you why. A lot of them are put together by Roman Catholics. A lot of them are put together by homosexuals. A lot of them are put together by people that do not believe that you have to trust in Jesus Christ to go to heaven. So my encouragement to you, because we're King James, and the reason why we're King James in our Bible is because it's an every word Bible. It's every word. If you have a modern translation that's, that, that leaves out just one verse, one ver isn't that a powerful verse, verse number 37? Isn't that a powerful verse? That, that's the reason why you can get baptised, and it's the reason why you can't get baptised if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you don't believe that, you can't get baptised. It means you're not saved because it's called believer's baptism. Amen? All right. Just seeing if you wait. Go to chapter 16. By the way, what works did the Ethiopian eunuch do? Uh, what works did the thief on the cross do? Does anyone know what works? The, th did the, the thief didn't even get baptised. And yet he confessed because the other guy, the other thief was railing on Jesus and that other thief says, hey, we're here for the right reason. He's not. And then he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your, into your kingdom. And he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He didn't become a church member. He didn't get baptized. He didn't take the sacraments. He didn't have the Lord's Supper. He didn't do any of that. Jesus said, you're coming to be with me in paradise. Isn't that a blessing? The Ethiopian eunuch didn't do anything either. Well, let's have a look at the Philippian jailer in, in Acts chapter 16. And let's just have a look at what kind of works that he had to do, whether he had to repent of all his sins or whether he had to make Jesus Lord of his life and, and all these sorts of things and, and had to obey what John MacArthur and John Piper and Paul Washer and all those other guys had to say. Let's just see what, what, what the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 16. Look at verse number 31. Verse 30, all right, let's look at verse 30. And, and he brought them out, so the, the jailer brings out uh, Paul and, and Silas, and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a good question. What have I got to do to be saved? Well, you know, you've got to, you've got to make Jesus Lord, you've got to be willing uh, to cease from your sin, because and, and, if you don't, you can't get saved. Is that what Paul said? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The only criteria... For you becoming a born-again Christian is believing and putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and, and, and praying that to him and going before him and doing that, whether you did it in a church service, whether you did that at home, whether you did it in your car, it doesn't matter where you did it, as long as you did it. Now, here's the question. Have you done it? Have you done it or are you trusting in other things? Let's go to Romans chapter 1. I'm trying to hurry. Romans chapter 1 because I want to get to Ephesians. <laughs> My goodness. Hey, listen, I noticed the last few times I've gone about 50 minutes. Let my people go. Remember I put that thing up the other day about a long sermon and a hostage situation? I, I'm, I am holding you hostage today. I'm just making no bones about it, all right? Look at Romans chapter 4. Look at verse number uh, 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh, it is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See that? What is it? Believing. Believing. Not, not doing something before or, or, or doing something after, because if I don't persevere, then I'm going to lose it. Well, what you're saying is that Jesus is not powerful enough to hold you. you you're, you're basically saying that you're stronger than him. Wow, I don't, I'm not stronger than Jesus, are you? All right, let's go to Ephesians. Firstly, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 for a minute. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted when? After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. Now, what's the gospel? It's the good news of Jesus Christ. 
It's the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, right? So you trusted him after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom, that's Jesus, also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Hallelujah. That's where you were preserved. You were preserved in Christ, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And chapter 4 and verse number 31, I says, it's, it's the redemption of the purchased possession, which is when Jesus comes back at the rapture. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Probably one of the, the earliest scripture that you memorized as a believer would have been Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But we can't forget verse number 10. But let's have a look at Ephesians 2 verse 8. Let's read it together in unison. Ready? Let's read. For by grace saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Stop there. So it's by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Salvation's a gift. I love gifts. Don't you love receiving gifts? It's such a blessing. It shows, it shows the, the concern and the compassion and the love of the giver. So Jesus loved you, God loved you, that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross, that through you believing in what Jesus done, he, he, you're gifted salvation. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, not through what you did or through what I did. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I reckon we'd have quite a few boasters here in this small congregation, wouldn't you? Like, if we had to do something, you know what I mean? Man alive, I delivered X amount of white goods or whatever it is, and, and, I, and I kissed so many grandmothers and just gave them a, you know, how do you do and all this sort of stuff. And, oh, man, I, I did this. I, or I worked on somebody's computer and I did this. Or perhaps I designed something. You know what I mean? Like, we could all say, whoa. And, and I tell you what, the things that we make and the things that we do, Hey, hey, I really enjoyed doing that, you know what I mean? But none of that, none of that gets anyone to heaven. None of it. It's, it's all going to burn up. Now look at verse number 10. For we are his workmanship. We're his product. He's done the work. Man, I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go there. You, you think about the potter and the clay. Who, is, who, who does the work? The potter does all the work. We just sit there as a lump while God forms us, right? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, future, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Should is a good word that goes with grace. If it was he will do good works, that's Calvinism. Because the Calvinist says he will. Remember, Piper said he will and must. So if it was will, it was Calvinism. If it's must, he must do good works, that's legalism. And legalism is the purest form of works salvation. That's what true legalism is all about. Works, what you do. But the Bible says should. Should a Christian do good works? Yeah. Yeah. Should a Christian be holy and live holy? Yeah. Should a Christian witness to people? Sure. Should a Christian go to church? Absolutely. They should. But it's not guaranteed they're going to do that. But that doesn't mean that's the basis of their salvation. Because I know of many a believer that's out here, born again, received Christ as their saviour, but are not in church. Should they be in church? Sure. So words are very important, aren't they? So when you look at that, we're created unto good works. That's a future tip. My good works reflect on the goodness and the graciousness of my God. Not for me to be saved or to keep my salvation, but to point to Jesus. And that we should walk in them. We should do that. That's what we should do. But if a believer's not, what's, what's the criteria for becoming a Christian? Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So salvation is a gift. It's not a performance. It's all because of the grace of God. It's your faith in what Jesus did. It's not you saying, well, I want to make the Lord of my life. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. 
uh, and, uh, and uh, receive Jesus, uh, you know, because he's the Lord of my life. That's not, that's not salvation. Jesus is Lord regardless of whether you say it or not. He is, that's who he is. You come to him believing of what he did on the cross, no more and no less. It's all what Jesus did. But the Trojan horse of lordship salvation is a back door for works. It's what you've got to do. You've got to cease. You've got to make him Lord. If you're not a disciple, then you're not a Christian. That's unbiblical. Follow the Bible. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, we thank you for the truth of the scripture. And I pray, Lord, if there's any here today that are unsure, not sure, whether they're here in person or whether they're watching through Facebook Live, I pray, Jesus, that you'd work in their heart. Holy Spirit of God, let them know, reveal the truth, open their eyes, open their heart. And may they receive Christ today. If there's any doubts, I pray, Jesus, that they would come and get that settled, that they may have assurance, that they know that they have eternal life because of what Jesus did. We love you for it, Lord, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.